All right, coaches, welcome back to Big Drew the World. We have episode 19 coming to you this way this week from season two, um, the single wing offense. We're going to be, uh, I'm kind of entitling it Fear the Wing. I'm ripping off sort of a theme there around the area. And I'll get to explain sort of why the single wing and everything else um, and just sort of goes around it. Today we're going to be talking about the history, and the history of the single wing is a fun thing to talk about because – I don't think you can really get done with it in one episode. We're actually going to take about three episodes just to get through the history and go through the different elements and different fathers, if you will, of the single wing. Today we're going to be talking mostly, you know, history when it comes to football. Um, so if you're not into that stuff, you may want to tune into another episode. If you're into that stuff like me, this is a purpose, perfect episode for you. But first, got to pay the bills, guys. Okay, the one blocking steam playbook, we have gotten it done, the complete system of Inside the Zone in our G-Series. This was our first episode that we launched way back in June, this past June of 2020. Um, what does this do? We've discounted down to $30 through December, then I'm taking it off the website. Okay, now, you missed the Black Friday sale when it was just 20 we got it at 30 and it's gone after that. Okay, you get access to Coach Allen for questions or concerns. I send video going over the plays. I send you a playbook, and I draw it up against whatever fronts you may experience. Okay, I, you, right now I'm going off it. I'll draw it up to five fronts. And, you know, if you want to critique it a little bit, that's fine. But what does that give you, too? Also, your 30 bucks gives you access to me for any questions, any answers on the steam, any answers on, like, what I look for as a play caller, that type of stuff. Okay. You know, when we get into December, when we get out of December into January and everything, we're going to be looking at different different items going up for sale right now. But that one bat block and steam playbook, it is what we're hitting right now through the end of December. Perfect deal. 30 bucks. Get it in. If you're getting ready to install in the spring, you want to add a little bit something, make something simpler for your offensive line. That's a good one to hit at. Now, why study the history of an offense? This has been a big question with people. Why, why in the world does it matter? Does it really truly matter to know who came up with the single wing offense? Probably not. Okay, but number one, I'm a real big history nerd. I actually am a history major who has to teach um, a freight algebra right now. And, you know, I'm a, I've always been a big guy in knowing why stuff has happened. What, you know, what, why was it created to begin with? What problems were they trying to answer? Why did I get into the air raid originally? I got into the air raid originally reading books by Mike Leach, reading books, you know, trying to remember the title. It's Stretch the Cornfield. Stretch the Cornfield, great book about Mike Leach and how mummies time in um, Iowa Wesleyan. Same with the perfect pass. I went and dug into all the history books of the air raid, and I enjoyed them a lot. What else can you learn by studying the history? When and where the evolutions were and what they were solving with each one. You know, right now I'm reading more on Lincoln Riley and how he changed up stuff from a true Mike Leach type of guy to when he went to ECU with Ruffin McNeil and then back to Oklahoma. Oddly enough that Riley would go to Oklahoma after Leach was Oklahoma, you know, really brought the Big 12 offense with uh, the air raid going into Oklahoma with Bob Stoops. You know, just – Different stuff like that, guys. I think you'd see you get to see what problems, what they were trying to look for. Because I think history is all cyclical. I've talked about this with several coaches. I think football is all cyclical. It all comes back around. Okay, you know the spread is in the spread was in vogue in 07 when I was playing high school football. Two by two, three by one spread. Okay, because I hate to call the spread an offense because there's so many different iterations of it. Now you're getting more into the option game, I think, whether it's RPOs or different. You're getting more back into the option game. I think you're going to see some people here very shortly start lining up in the eye and you having to defend smash mouth football because everybody's been prepared to defend spread formations. But I think I'm not the only one. I think there's a lot of people who have been making that argument for years. But that's why I study the history. So you can know what's coming back around and you can be ahead of the game and you can know what the answers are. You know, what does this solve? Why did I do this? Because obviously if you had superior athletes, why don't you just run the easiest offense at the time? Why the single wing? Number one, it won, it won our Twitter poll, but I was actually very excited 
that had won the Twitter poll. So my little history here with the single wing, okay, here's a picture from the first football playoff game I ever coached in. Uh, we played Clark County High School. It's a school up near West Virginia, up the West Virginia, Virginia border, up in Berryville, Virginia. Very good, strong high school football team. We won that game 7 and nothing. I was going back reading a newspaper article. Um, first playoff game, first playoff win at the school we won in 2010 in eight years. Uh, and only the second season ever we had won a playoff game in school history. You know, so really helping to turn around the program. You see our quarterback and our uh, fullback right there just sort of celebrating um, after the final whistle. We beat that team 7 to nothing, guys. And I was looking back up because I remembered we scored in the second quarter. We scored on a 91-yard touchdown drive. Kid who ended up going and playing some football at Virginia Tech, which is big for a small school like us, he scores on a 91-yard drive. And we're able to shut them down, win 7 nothing. I mean, our defensive coordinator, Seth Wilkerson, was really great at stopping a single wing. And I remember that game. It was also my first playoff game I've ever been up in a booth. Um, I was 19 years old coaching high school football. I was primarily with JB. I wasn't really, you know, on varsity. I was just sort of there. But I remember the single wing offense. And I remember riding up to Clark County on the back – in the back of a uh, equipment van, sitting on a cooler. Legals all get out. Sat on a cooler from Buckingham, Virginia to Berryville, Virginia, because I didn't want to ride the team bus. Still don't like riding the team bus, just going to be honest. And now I'm getting into NFCs. But that's why I started getting in the single wing. Then, in 2015, started to take note of school who's perennially been bad, Stan River High School. Uh, fairly near where I am now, about 30 minutes away from where I coach in Alta Vista, about an hour away from where I live in Chatham, Virginia. 2015, right before I come down to Chatham, so closer to their neck of the woods, I hear about this, they beat Western Albemarle in the Division Three playoffs, 85-79 to 79 in a second-round playoff game. I'm thinking, 85-79, to 79, what in the world? Okay, and then I see – this fellow is running back. He's a cover shoot of the uh, page. Guy named Grayson Overstreet. This dude is a man. I'm just going to tell you, when I saw him my second year as a head coach at Chatham, I saw him getting ready to go into something we call the Titan Trophy Awards, and they announced all these guys at a local minor league baseball team game. And he comes walking in. He's like 6'4", six, 6'3", six, just jacked. Just I'm like, that dude is a dude. He ends up – this, just being blunt, this white kid right here sets all the Virginia State rushing records, except for single season. And the game that this picture was taken at, I remember going. This was his last game in high school. I went to the state semifinal game. You have him, who's like the career rushing leader, versus the single season rushing leader in Lala Davis for uh, Heritage. Heck of a ball game. You know – you want to get into Stan River, they scored 2,006 points from 2015 to 2017. So they averaged like 48 points a game from that stretch. State finalists and state semifinalists. State finalists in 16, state semifinalists in 17. So when I moved down to Chatham in 16, I got to see them a little bit more. And I was like, ah, this is interesting. Single wing offense. Plus, man, I'm from Buckingham. And if you know Buckingham football in Central Virginia, we grow up wanting to hammer people. We grow up wanting to put a beating on people, and we started to run some more single-wing elements into our offense in 2015. It also helped for us that I think our sniffer back, H-back, whatever you want to call him, was about 260, 270, and our tight end was about 250, 255, and went on to be a Division One DN. That helped. So that's the why for the single-wing. Uh, basis is a single wing when we're talking about, you know, it comes up and it's a t defined by a core of four backs, your tailback, your wing back, your quarterback or blocking back, and your fullback. Um, other definitions of it, unbalanced line and trickeration. You've got different ball fakes. You've got different plays run off of one another. You're not knowing where the ball is going. And that's the really cool thing about the single wing. Now, today, like I told you, we're getting into the history. And the single wing is brought to you by a guy named Pop Warner. You probably remember, you probably have heard of the name from Pop Warner Football. 
Okay? So Pop Warner, he's 21 years old when he goes to Cornell. Just give you a little bit of history. You've got to know history of the guy. Ends up going, plays for Cornell, 1892 to 1894, then becomes a head coach at Georgia. He, you know, he's met on the bus, on the train, riding to Ithaca. Meets Carl Johansson, head football coach at Cornell. And he sees this 21-year-old, 200-pound guy. Says he's going to Cornell. And he tells him, basically, you got to come play football. Come play football. He had no intention of playing football prior to that. Um, and he ends up being the head coach at University of Georgia when he gets done at Cornell. And then he goes from Georgia to Iowa State. And then back then to Carlisle for one term and then back to Cornell. Okay, he kind of hopped between Cornell. He kind of goes to Carlisle, then goes back to Cornell, then goes to Car- Carlisle again. And we're going to talk about both stints at Carlisle. Today is really a talk on Carlisle and what made that special. Okay, and you got the Carlisle Indian School. All right, Car- Carlisle Industrial Indian Store, Warner's going to Pop Warner's going to arrive in 1899. It's a flagship Indian boarding school to try to take Native Americans and get them ready for the weirdo world, basically. And, he, and he's hit with this sum of $1,200. Big payday. Big payday in 1899, guys. And he gets there, and his players are outweighed, and it must depend on speed and agility over physical force. He had seen them against Cornell and had been so impressed by – you know, this was a team that was winning football games and being competitive with big-time football teams with speed over and agility instead of physical force. They found ways to adapt to their talent. And he considered Carlisle to be the future of football. So you can imagine he's at Cornell. He's at an Ivy League institution. It's alma mater, and he's like, that's the future of football right there. That is the future of football at Carlisle. So when he comes in, his first stint there, Bucks routine. What happens? He has to learn really quickly. He comes in, good good advice for coaches. Certain kids can't, certain guys aren't built the same way. He comes in with his normal approach. He's cussing. He's got strict routines. And, you know, football's run sort of like a military. In the the uh, Carlisle players did buck that. They bucked it completely. They quit showing up to practice. It was a big mess. So what's he do? He's forced to adjust his methods and his approaches to players. He's forced to adjust how things are done. Good example, if you've ever gone to different schools, boom, 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 boom. Certain stuff is taught differently. You know, I've talked with coaches before. If I'm at this school... You say, you know, A double S. That's that's gonna get me in trouble at this school, it's not gonna get me in trouble at the other school. They're gonna respond to that at this school, they're not gonna respond to that at that school. Um, if I give them strict guidelines to follow, some schools will thrive, some students will thrive, some students won't. It just happens. But we see that happening in 1899, over a hundred years ago, guys. So when we sit there and go, kids have changed, have they really? But Warner brings immediate improvement. You know, some of the innovations, you have a three-point stance from the running back because he wanted to adapt to the sprinter stance. Okay, he invents a hidden ball trick. So, you know, the old hidden ball trick where you catch the kickoff, you all huddle up, and then you break from the huddle and nobody can tell who has the ball. He does that to stay in the game and, all, and beat Harvard in 1903 and then returns to Cornell briefly as their head coach. It's the second stint at Cornell that we're going to talk about most. Our second stint and Carlisle, we're going to talk about the most. Carlisle round two. Innovation is still the name of the game. This is 1907 to 1914. In that period, they win 10 games or more five times. They win a national championship. And it contributes what he calls the Carlisle formation, where the Carlisle formation right here is all based on trickeration where you don't know who's going to get the ball. Okay, unbalanced line, everybody shifted over. You can snap in between the tailback and the fullback. The quarterback's really used as a blocking back. And this is where the terms really quarterback, fullback, tailback really come from. And your wingback. 
And the Charlotte formation was focusing on deception instead of overpowering your opponent. I found this fascinating because nowadays I see teams like this, like Stan River. I talked about Stan River for a little bit. They were built on this nasty, tough, we're going to overpower you culture. So for the original single wing offense to be the first offense to based on deception, based on not lining up and knowing, hey, we're coming here, bud, have fun. Now, Warner's second stand Carlisle produces three major things. Jim Thorpe, which we'll talk about in a second. Extensive additions to the football fat passing game and backfield fakes. The big one I want to talk about today is Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe, okay? I want you to picture Jim Thorpe ends up being an Olympian, an Olympian um, track and field athlete. You know, he's just excellent football. Compete in track, football, baseball, lacrosse, ballroom dancing even for Carlisle. You know, we had to give his Olympic medals back. We know that story. I want to talk about Jim in college. Jim goes walking past the track team practicing. Pop Warner's also the track coach. And he sees the high jumpers working. And in street clothes, okay, and you're thinking, okay, street clothes aren't that big of a deal with our kids back in the day. Street clothes back then. You know, these are thick, you know, staunchy probably pants, long shirt, that type of stuff. He has a 5'9 high jump, beats all the other high jumpers. Okay, a little bit different, a little bit different breed of a guy. I mean, this is the guy who ends up going and winning an Olympic medal on in shoes that he found that don't even match. Okay? So, Warner coached Thorpe on the track team. And Thor- Thorpe's interested in playing football. Warner doesn't really know. He figures, okay, I'll get him to come out to practice. We'll see what happens. Okay, we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll get him to come out to practice. I'm sure he'll give a go at it, and then he'll quit. You know, that's just – it's no problem about it. He'll just go and he'll quit. And this is my thing to you guys. Be cognizant of your athletes. Get your athletes the ball. Get your athletes into football. So they bring Jim out there, and he goes through, and the description basically said he ran through, over, and around people without being tackled and could l- come back and be lapped again against their starting defense. Like he could go anytime he wanted. Through two plays, the defense came up and said, nope. He, uh, after two plays of scoring, Jim runs over to Pop Warren and goes, nobody's going to tackle Jim. Pop's like, Okay. Guess I'm going to build my offense around that guy. And that's what's expected with this single wing when we get to talking about it. Remember, the original single wing offense was built around Jim Thorpe, built around a stud. When I think of Jim Thorpe, when I think of Jim Thorpe, I'm going to go back a few slides. I think of Grayson Overstreet. I think of a stud athlete that they're building around. And you all, do you need it necessarily? Probably not. But this is what the offense is originally invented around. That's my picture right there. When I'm thinking, when I can put in and focus in on Jim Thorpe, I think of a guy like Grayson Overstreet from Stan River in 16 and 17. Jim ends up playing running back, defense back, place kicker, and punter. The team upsets Harvard in 1911, 1912. They win the national championship. He ends up in that season alone scoring 25 touchdowns, 198 points. Three-time All-American. I mean, just ridiculous stats. And the influence as we get ready, the influence as we get ready to um, go into our next section, okay? College football playbooks prior to 1950 become dominated by versions of the single wing that Warner comes up with, okay? Who are you going to steal from? You're going to steal from the the best teams of the time right there. So for... Prior to 1950, Pop Warner's Carlisle teams were the best teams of the time. They're going to the Northeast. They're beating these these teams of Harvard, uh, Yale, Princeton, those types of teams. They're the teams you want to steal from. They're doing what we do. Okay, how many of y'all ripped off Urban Meyer's spread when Tim Tebow was running? And how many of us had a Tim Tebow? Exactly. How many of y'all got, you know, uh, sucked into the air raid when you see Mike Leach run it? But how many of us have his quarterbacks? 
So we do the same things years later. Okay? One of the guys who would go on to get his influence is a guy named Dana Bible. Sorry there, guys. I keep trying to move my video. Dana Bible. And that's what's going to be on our tab next time. We're going to talk about Dana Bible. I don't want to talk about the entire history of the wing team because I'm afraid I'll be here for a th- our history of the single wing because I'm afraid I'll be here for a 30-minute video, and I'll get y'all to watch it for two, three minutes. I want you to come back sucked in next time because we're going to talk about the single wing going down and the adjustments a guy named Dana Bible makes at the University of Texas. Okay? That's what we're going to talk about next time. I mean, after that, you know, we're going to talk about the different variations that those playbooks had because they would come in and they'd do what we do. They'd tinker. They tinker to see how they want to run it. Lincoln Riley adjusting Mike Leach's air raid. Dana Bible adjusting Pop Warner's single wing. All right, that's what's on next time. Remember, coaches, you know, as we get into this single wing, I'm telling you, I love the history of football. I love these types of series. I'm excited for this type of series. I have my episodes planned out. This is going to be awesome, okay? I think it'll be a fun one to get into as we get into Christmas. You get a little bit of history with you. Um. Get a little bit of history, get a little bit of fun. I think you'll be excited for it. Um, remember, guys, going back in, selling it again, that one bag blocking scene play blocking scene playbook. You can email me. I'm going to put the description in the link and uh, the link in the description for my email. Just email me for it. I'm also going to have a link. You can just fill it out if you want. Yay. Send it to this email. You know, what fronts you want. I'm going to put that link. In the description, that way you can go ahead and get that done. Next time we're going to talk about Dana Bible and how he adjusts a single wing. All right, guys, remember, coaches, if you want to dominate and win football games, you got to dominate in the trenches. And to do that, you got to know that bigs rule the world. I'll see you next time, coaches.